Okay, Applet, here we go again. So we, we've already talked about the need itself. I wanted to, you to see what the story was so that we could bring kind of that that story and, and you can see parallels of this for when I talk about Augustus and his history. And then probably the better thing is to go back and, and kind of review that summary of the Aeneid again so you can see it from the other perspective. But the two are inextricably linked, Augustus and, and what he saw as his program of rule and how he saw his Rome was supposed to be, and the, the Rome or the version of Roman history that Virgil lays out in, in the Aeneid. But uh, I'm going to start back at the beginning here, but I'm, we're going to go really, really quickly uh, and then lead up to the time of Julius Caesar. Okay, so again, just like the last one, this is probably going to be about 30 minutes or so. So, you know, listen for five minutes, take notes on the sheets, uh, take a break, take a stretch break, uh, you know, high five each other until you pat each other on the back and then and then uh, forge ahead for another five, ten minutes. All right, here we go. So remember, Rome was founded on 753 BC, actually April 21st. If we look at what uh, um, if we look at what Livy says, we've dated it to April 21st, 753 BC, and they're founded by Romulus and Remus, these twins that were cast out of Alba Longa by a king, uh, and they float down the river Tiber. They come up to the edge of the Tiber River. And they are nursed back to immediate health by this uh, this she wolf, this lupa, and then uh, the lupa's uh, shepherd Faustulus comes along and takes them under his wing and raises them. And then when they're old enough, el uh, when they're old enough, the the twins Romulus and Remus go back to Alba Longa and depose the king and right the wrongs, and then they make their way back to to what is now Rome. And uh, they say, okay, you know, we've got uh, we got some power, we've got some people. Uh, what do we do? And so they're going to found the city. Well, the problem is you can't have two founders, right? So the story is that they go up on a hill to try to figure out where to settle their people, and one of them sees six birds, but then the other one sees twelve, but he sees them after the first guy. So which one is right? Is it the guy that sees them first, or the guy that sees more? Well, just like good Romans, they fight it out, and Romulus kills Remus. His his twin brother, right? So the, the idea of fratricide, the idea of civil war is built into Roman DNA. And uh, I guess if Re Remus won, it'd be called Reem, right? But, but Romulus wins, and he founds Rome on April 21st, 753 BC. And he is the first of seven kings. Here are the first four, Numa, Tullus, and Ancus Marcius. And then the last three kings are actually not even Roman. They're Etruscan. And so here, here is Etruria, and Rome was sort of conquered by Etruria, even though the Romans didn't like to say that. But there, there are these three kings, um, and eventually the, the, this guy, Tarquinius Superbus, is so awful that the Romans say, you know what, I've had enough of you. And they revolt against him, and they say, you know, we've had enough of kings. And so in 509 BC, they create a republic, and they say, okay, rule of one guy, not good, so we're going to create a rule of two people. So they take the consuls that had already been in place to advise the king, and they make them the rulers. And they each have veto power over each other. And the guy Brutus, that is the, the long descendant of the guy who eventually um, helps kill Julius Caesar, he is the first consul along with a guy named Collatinus, whose wife, incidentally, is the one that Tarquinius Superbus rapes, uh, or excuse me, Tar Tarquinius Superbus' brother rapes, and, and it causes the, the downfall of the of Superbus in the monarchy. So they become power, uh, they become the, the two consuls, and consuls are only supposed to rule for, every, for, for one year, so it keeps them from amassing too much power. Um, they're at the head of the army, but again, they've gotta, they've, gotta, they've gotta relieve themselves of duty after a year, so they can't amass military power, they fight for Rome, no one is loyal to any one man. It's a good system, sort of, and they spend the next 300 years really trying to perfect it. Uh, and they grow. And the problem with growing is that you're going to run into conflict with other foreign powers. And so let me let me flip ahead here for a second here. So in the 300 years from 509 to, to, to 200, they basically expand all the way through Italy. Well, the problem with that is that here's Carthage, this African power, and they were the major dominant Mediterranean power at the time. And so Rome starts coming into sort of well, conflicts with them over trade routes and rights to do business with these people and that people. And one of the major issues is this little strait right here called the Strait of Messina, or sometimes the Messana. And uh, you can see why it would be important, because if you're Greek and you're trading with Romans, 
Well, you can either do this and go all the way around Sicily, um, and that's you know a long voyage, or you can zip right through that strait, and that saves you weeks and, and thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, so it's a really important strait, and uh, you can make a lot of money off it because you can tax people. You know, if it takes me an extra twenty thousand dollars to move around Sicily, I'll, I'll gladly pay the thousand dollar tax just to go through here. So they run into a competition with each other, and eventually they go to war. And they, they war for almost 25 years, you can see, 264 to 241. Uh, Rome defeats them and you know, mitigates their authority, uh, you know, tells them, okay, you know, we're, you're conquered, so you have to ask us for, for things, all of this kind of thing. And that lasts for a few years until the next generation of Carthaginians come along. And this guy's name is Hannibal. And Hannibal's dad was defeated by the Romans, Hans Drubal. And Hannibal says, you know what, um, I, I'm not okay with this. And he essentially leads Carthage into a very contentious war with Rome in the Second Punic War, the Second Carthaginian War. And uh, he almost destroys Rome, except that he, he isn't fully supported by, by the uh, Carthaginian Senate. So he marches all the way to Rome, and he needs supplies and everything, but Carthage won't send him. So he, he, he basically is... is um, it loses all thousands and thousands, hundred thousand soldiers, and Rome attacks him when he's weak, and Rome eventually kills him. Um, so Carthage is utterly destroyed. Uh, they're 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 a shade of what they were, but they still are there, and Rome is fine with that, except for there's a growing contingent of Romans led by Cato the Elder, who is not okay with it, and he says, "Look, we're not going to be safe until Carthage is completely destroyed." And so Cato is the one that. He ended every speech in the Senate with Carthago delenda S. Carth Carthage must be destroyed. And, Car and Rome bullies Carthage into a third Punic War and, um, and, and literally uh, raises the city to the ground. And the story goes that they sowed salt into the earth so that nothing could grow there ever again. Um, but they sold off all the women and children to slavery and they killed all the men. And, um, and so, yeah, so the, the, it, we're lucky we can even find anything that's Carthaginian here today in, our, in the excavations. Um, so Rome becomes the power of the Mediterranean. I mean, they, they, they leap into all of this territory, and this is a problem for the rest of Roman history. Remember, you have these consuls that only have power for one year. Well, how are you going to have a guy rule, maintain rule in this part if you can only rule it for one year? I mean, it's going to take months to get over there and, and this really sets the stage for these two guys, two really powerful guys. Look at this, consul seven times in a row. And the reason he is consul seven times in a row, or not seven times in a row, but seven times total, but it is three or four times in a row. The reason he's consul seven times is because you're only allowed to be consul for a year, so they keep having to renew his consulship so he can stay and rule parts of Rome. You got another guy who is consul, and, and a really great general, and Sola was his right-hand man. And the byproduct of all of this stuff is that while Marius is consul again and again and again, the soldiers become loyal to him, not to this idea of Rome, or not to the Roman state. They become loyal to him. So he becomes a really powerful general, and it becomes really common for these guys to get a consulship and then say, okay, well, I'm going to become consul, but my real deal is that I'm going to go off to Spain, or I'm going to go off to Gaul, or I'm going to go off to Numidia, or wherever, and I am going to amass this massive military, a huge amount of money, and this army that's loyal to me. And then I can go, I can get what I need to get done, because if I go to the Senate and ask for stuff, and they refuse me, well, then I can just say, okay, well, me and my 30,000 soldiers would really, really like to have this or that, and the Senate has to say okay. Well, these two come to power, uh, and they they butt heads, and there's a massive civil war, and um, it destroys Rome. Marius eventually loses because he, they, they, they each march on Rome in turn. Marius eventually dies of dysentery, probably a couple other diseases, in Africa, and so Sulla takes over as dictator. And he, um, you got to give him credit, he was ruthless, but when he becomes dictator, he stays dictator for about two and a half years, and his whole point of becoming dictator 
was to make sure that he could never, there would never be another him ever again. So for two and a half years, he rewrites the entire Roman legal system and constitution, and then he willfully gives up his dictatorship and says, I'm out. And he goes and he parties himself to death for about a year and then, and then dies. Uh, it's just crazy. Um, his, his reforms don't really last long, and that's partly because of this guy. Now, we love this guy. But we love him because he was the winner, and history is always good with the winners. They're always loyal to the winners and, and kind to the winners. But he, he was, got to be honest, guys, I like him, but he was pretty awful. And he really only was concerned about one thing and one man, and that was this guy right here. Um, he was born in 100, so it's an easy date to remember, and we know that he was killed. He was assassinated in the Ides of March in 44 B.C. The Ides of March is the 15th of March. He becomes consul. The very first year that he's able to become consul, which is a huge distinction, it's called suo anno, in one's own year. Uh, and he becomes consul in that remarkable way because he is smart enough to know he's got to consolidate power and form alliances and partnerships and all of that kind of stuff. And then when he's done becoming consul, or when he's done with his consulship, he knows that he needs to go to a really great province, Gaul, and amass an army and wealth and all of that stuff, and that's exactly what he does. Remember, you're only supposed to be proconsul for a year, and he gets through this first triumvirate, a, a, a proconsulship that lasts for 10 years. So let's talk about this for a second. So as Caesar is gaining power in Rome, there's also this other guy named Pompey, Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, Pompey the Great. He named himself the Great, you guys. At least he thought he was great. He was right. He really was great. He was probably a better general than Caesar was even. Um, you also have Crassus. And Crassus was, a, he was a good Roman, a good leader, but nothing special compared to these two guys. But he had a ton of money. He was the wealthiest guy in Rome. And in order to amass power, you got to bribe. And in order to become the consul, you got to bribe. So they formed a partnership with him and got the money. Caesar went madly in debt with Crassus, but it's okay because they're partners. They form this alliance, they get Caesar his consulship, they, they get everything else that they're after, and they get Caesar his proconsulship in Gaul. Well, here we go. Now the fireworks start. Caesar has this massive army in Gaul, and he's in Gaul for what should ultimately be 10 years. He, he has it for five years, and then it gets renewed for another five years. Well, while he's in Gaul, the Senate starts freaking out because he's using this, he's getting this massive army, and they're afraid, okay, he's going to become another Sola, another Marius, um, and use that army to get what he wants. And, and they're exactly right. So the Senate starts turning Pompey against Caesar, and this is helped by the fact that Pompey, Pompey's wife, Caesar's daughter, who and they had this arranged marriage to kind of uh, cement the partnership, she dies. And then Crassus, the third wheel in the in the first triumvirate, he dies fighting uh, Cari, the fighting the Parthians at Cari. So now it's just two of them, right? Three people good, they can each check each, check each other, but the, when there's two, it's just man versus man. So that's no good. So the Senate completely flips Pompey, and he becomes the champion of their of their cause against Caesar. And so Caesar is supposed to rule in Gaul until 48 BC. When he finishes his, his proconsulship, when he finishes his massive war in Gaul with his army and all of that sort of stuff, he knows one thing. If he goes back to Rome as a private citizen, when you, when you come back to Rome, you automatically give up your, your military leadership. So you become a Joe Schmo again. He knows if he comes back to Rome and becomes a private citizen, that all of the bribing and extorting and, and breaking the law that he did to get where he is is going to come back to haunt him. He's going to be hauled up on so many charges. There's no way he can win. He's going to be exiled from Rome. He's going to lose all of his power. He's going to lose all of his money. He is going to be done. Uh, and so he says, okay, I want to run for the consulship again in absentia. While I'm still in Gaul, I, know I want to win the consulship and that way his, his power can just keep going and he'll never become a private citizen. Okay, well, for obvious reasons, the Senate and Pompey don't want that. And so Caesar sort of camps out in Gaul right here. And they just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, sending letters. Can I do it? No. Please, no. Please, no. Pretty please, no. And eventually he says, okay, fine, you force my hand. And he crosses the Rubicon, that, that little tiny river that's the de facto boundary between 
Gaul and Italia, the Roman territory there, and with his army, and so he declares war on Rome. So you do. You have another Marius and Sola. Uh, Pompey and the Senate get the heck out of Dodge immediately to kind of regroup and, and figure out what to do. Uh, Caesar goes to Rome, calls himself dictator, which is a legitimate position. You, you can There was a dictatorship in, in Rome for, for six months, and he, he calls himself dictator for six months and then calls himself dictator again and again and again. He fills the Senate with all of his cronies. Um, Pompey and Caesar actually meet in battle a year later at Pharsalus. Caesar soundly defeats Pompey, and Pompey flees actually to Egypt to get reinforcements from Cleopatra, and Cleopatra, who has already struck up an alliance with Caesar, meets Pompey and beheads him in front of his wife and his son. Uh, really awful scene. Uh, not his wife, I'm sorry, but his, but, but his family. Uh, and then she sends Pompey's behead, uh, head back to Caesar, and there's this really great line from the biographies that says that when Caesar sees Pompey's head, he weeps because... They were political enemies, but not personal enemies. So anyway, back to Rome. Uh, Caesar becomes dictator for life. And notice that this happens in 44. Well, we know he dies in March, right? So the next month. As soon as he's declared dictator for life, the senators, his, his enemies, get together and they say, you know what? All that is is a king. We threw out the kings. You know, we, we had Sola. We, we figured out that was bad. This, this is ridiculous. So they hatch a conspiracy to, to get rid of him. And this conspiracy is hurried along by the fact that he plans on, on leaving in mid-March to go to Parthia to avenge Crassus's death. So Caesar calls a meeting of the Senate on March 15th on the Ides to kind of tell everybody what's going on with that. And so the, they, you know, the conspirators, the, the, the assassins meet together and they plan. And they say, okay, when he gets there and he calls a meeting of the Senate, we're going to line up and you know have him sign things and all of this kind of stuff and one of us is going to yank his toga down and that's going to be a signal we're going to surround him and we're going to stab him to death the cool thing about or the ironic thing about his death is that when they meet they don't meet in the senate house because the senate is too big to be held in the senate house they meet in the theater of pompey in this annex building that today is actually inhabited by a bunch of cats but whatever uh, and at the foot of pompey's statue i'd like to think that this is a pretty accurate recreation he is stabbed to death and, uh, and then madness ensues. They, they, they had to do it. They had to hatch the plan so quickly. They didn't think about what to do after that. And so there was massive chaos in the city. They, the, the mob takes his, takes his body back to the Roman Forum. They burn it. Mark Antony gets up there, Caesar's right-hand man, and says, you know, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. We come to bury Caesar, not to, you know, mourn Caesar, not to, you know, whatever. And all of this kind of thing. And I'm sure he didn't say exactly that, but, you know, Shakespeare would like us to think so. Um, so, unbeknownst to a lot of people, um, in, in Caesar's life, he had actually seen some talent in a really young boy named Octavian, who was his grandnephew. So, I mean, barely related to him. Uh, you know, think of who your great uncles are. And if you can think of them right off the top of your head, well done. Uh, but barely, barely related to Caesar is this kid. And he's 18 years old when Caesar dies. Caesar makes Octavian the heir to his legacy. So he gives a fifth of it to Mark Antony, he gives a fifth of it to some other people, but he makes the majority owner of Caesar's heir, of Caesar's legacy, this 18-year-old kid. I mean, people were flipping out when this happened. They thought that Caesar had played like one last cruel joke on Rome and, you know, basically like, ha, 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 okay, see see what you can do without me, Rome. Here we go. Here's this young kid who, by the way, looked pretty effeminate, was skinny, was also very sick all the time. He, he, he had all sorts of maladies and, um, and just didn't look the part either. But he was really smart. Uh, and thankfully, he, he matched wits against Antony's brawn because Antony, Caesar's right-hand man, was the quintessential Roman soldier, Roman general. I mean, you know, six foot tall, broad-shouldered, muscular, had been in tons of battles, and everybody thought that he was the guy that was going to take over after Julius Caesar. But, of course, Caesar didn't see it that way. He saw muscles here, but he saw brains here. So immediately the two of them go at it. Um, Octavian immediately starts a smear campaign against Antony, again, using his brains against Antony's muscle. 
uh, Octavian gets the money. He secures the money. He also gets the legions on his side, which is really smart. And Antony kind of, you know, they eventually they, they come to head. I say eventually, but almost right away. I mean, April in 43, they fight. Antony uh, is defeated, essentially, although the, some, a lot of political uh, allies of Octavian die. And Octavian is elected consul, and he gets more legions. But hold on. We still have those conspirators out there that we got to deal with. So Brutus, Cassius, Casca, all those other guys. So Antony and Octavian create a truce, and they say, okay, tell you what, we're going to get together, and we're going to go after these assassins. Uh, what happens after that, whatever, but we're going we're gonna to pool our resources here and go after them. So that's exactly what they do. And they, they defeat them at Philippi a year later, and they need a lot of money. And so just like Marius and Sulla before them, they prescribe people, and guys, this is terrible. So this a prescription list is a list of political enemies, and they, they would put these things up in the city of Rome, and, and it literally worked like this. If, Zergim, if you are an enemy of mine, I'm going to put your name up on a list, and Maureen, if you're walking around, because you're a friend of mine, if you're walking around and you see Zergim, you kill him, you bring me proof that you killed him, and I will give you money. So they ransom the deaths of all their political enemies, but the problem is that, you know, Zergim... Might be a political enemy one day, but you know the next day we find out. Oh no 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 no! He's he's sympathetic to me. So okay, we take his name off the list. But then I hear something else bad about him, and I put his name back up. I mean, it was just awful. It was chaos, blood in the streets, and uh, Octavian used this and got a lot of money that way, uh, including taking over Virgil's farm and settling some veteran soldiers there. So anyway, so Octavian gets power that way. He defeats. Um, or sorry, Octavian and Antony defeat the, the conspirators, and then they come up with a settlement. Sorry for the colors here because they don't match up, but let me, let me tell you here. So Antony, they give Antony Gaul, and they give him the east, including Egypt. All this. Octavian takes Spain, and then all of this. Okay? So Antony, Gaul, all of this, Octavian, Spain, and all of Africa except for Egypt. Well, that's okay. The two get together. They're going to fight, actually, but they, the troops refuse to fight. So they say, okay, well, we're going to you know, create another triumvirate and, uh, and, and partnership. And they try to co-rule, and they don't, it doesn't work very well. And here's, here's the problem. Uh, Octavian gets another military glory by defeating Sextus Pompey, who is known, always known as a pirate. Um, he is awesome. If you ever want to read a biography of a good, good uh, classical Roman uh, you got to read about this guy. He's amazing. He doesn't get nearly enough credit. Remember the third member of the triumvirate? They basically just tell him to go home. They say, you know what? We got what you need from, from you, Lepidus. So you just go back to Rome and you hang out. And they trump up a charge against against him. Um, remember I told you Antony had Egypt? Well, Antony keeps going back to Egypt more and more. And who is in Egypt but Cleopatra? Cleopatra, the same Cleopatra who had a son named Caesarian with Julius Caesar. So Cleopatra definitely knew what she was doing by allying herself with really powerful Romans. Well, she decides that Antony is the guy that she needs to ally with. And he keeps coming back to her and shacking up with her. But the problem is that he is already married to Octavian's sister. Octavian kind of plays the trump card. He says, you know what? I'm going to stir things up. He sends Octavia to pay a visit to Antony, and Antony won't see her. Antony rejects Octavia. She has to go back to Rome disgraced, you know, completely enrages Octavian, of course, but Octavian knew this was coming. But here's the deal. Antony completely becomes Egyptian. He has three kids with Cleopatra, twins, and then another kid. He holds military triumphs in Egypt, and then in his will, he donates, or actually not in his will, that comes later, but he gives all of this money and all of this land to his sons. Check this out. He gives to one of his sons, no, look at the name too, Alexander Helios, right? These, these very Greek names. Um, he gives Parthia to him. To another son, he gives Syrian Asia Minor. He gives Cyrenaica and Crete to his daughter, Cleopatra Selene. He also says, remember that son by Julius Caesar, Caesarian? He says, you know what? He is actually the legitimate heir to Caesar and not Octavian. He calls him king of kings. He calls Cleopatra queen of queens. And sets himself up as the despot of, of Egypt and this foreign power. 
So Octavian, this plays right into Octavian's hands because he wants to defeat Antony, but he doesn't. The Civil War is bad press. So he starts immediately saying, okay, Antony is a foreign enemy. He's an Egyptian, and we've, he, he's going to rise up and use all of Rome's resources against us. We've got to take care of this guy. So he spreads the words about those donations. He also steals Antony's will out of the Vestal Virgin's house and reads it out loud to the Senate. Now, the senators had heard rumors of all the stuff that Antony did, but they had no idea that he was doing it. They didn't really understand exactly and really weren't sure. The Senate is absolutely stunned when they hear about all of Antony's basically giving everything that he had done, all this Roman stuff, to Egypt, Cleopatra, and his sons by, by Cleopatra. And so this immediately precipitates the civil war, and Antony divorces Octavia, Octavian declares war in 32, and a year later they meet at Actium. Now look, Virgil will tell you, and Augustus will tell you that this was a huge battle, uh, bravely fought and, 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 and won, it wasn't. So he, and by the way, here's Actium. It's in Greece. You can see it. You would never know this city except for this battle. Um, it's such a minor little city. But here we go. Here's Antony, and here are his forces, his ships. Marcus Agrippa, Octavian's right hand man, lines up all of his ships right here. And essentially, all that happens is that they jockey for position. They try to, you know, get each other to 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 make the first blow. But Antony says, you know what, I, I can't win this. And he, all he does is he and uh, Cleopatra tell their ships to just make a hole. It's almost like a, a football game, you know, make a hole for the running back. And they just, they make a hole and they run. And they run back to Egypt and they know that they're, they're toast. And so they go back to Egypt. They partied up for a year. And when Octavian comes knocking on the door in 30, they commit suicide. So Octavian takes Egypt as a Roman province. He comes back in, in 30, and he starts his rule. So he comes back in, in, in 30, you know, end of 30, beginning of 29, and he starts his triumph, and he starts consolidating his power. But I do want you to know a couple things have been happening in Rome at this point. As early as 36, everything starts moving for Octavian to become, you know, the new ruler of Rome, and he gets, he gets the Senate to give him a house on the Palatine, so we get palace from this, right? Um, and, uh, and then he, he tasks his right-hand man with beautifying Rome. So Augustus is the one that says, I found Rome made of brick, and I left it made of marble. Well, look, if you're in this downtrodden city, the city where blood was flowing through the streets, and all of a sudden you have a leader who is spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to bring new aqueducts and fountains and, and new bath complexes and rebuilding and building new things, you're going to like him. Right? I mean, the reason that we like Ted Turner is because we go to his stadium, well, not, not much longer, but we go to his stadium for Braves games and we have fun. And this, is, this is Octavian's propaganda for the city of Rome. Uh, he comes back and he, and he lavishes the city with this triumph and all of this money from a foreign power. Remember, not a civil war, a foreign power. And then when that's over, he and Agrippa kind of rule together. I mean, Augustus is the face. Agrippa is the, the man behind the scenes. And they say, you know what, all that Triumvir stuff, you know, we did what we had to do, but forget it. That's all over, and they annul all the acts. So as he's going through his rule, he's got to convince all the Roman people that he is the man. He's always been the man. He will always be the man. So he establishes this whole kind of mythology about himself. Um, you don't have to worry about all these guys, but I will tell you, Atia is his mom, and he, is, he, he perpetuates a story where Atia went to the Temple of Apollo and spent the night there, and in that night she was uh, she was um, inseminated by a snake, and so that Octavian is the son of Adia and this Apollonian serpent, uh, which is ridiculous, and no one really believed it, but it's a great story, and it really cements that Apollo is his patron deity. He builds a temple of Apollo on the Palatine, and he builds it connected to his own house. Where does Augustus' house end and the Temple of Apollo begin? Where does Augustus end and a god begins? Who knows? They're one and the same. But he doesn't have to say this. He just builds the stuff, and the narrative explains itself to the people. He rebuilds the curia that burnt down when Julius Caesar was, was cremated in the forum. He builds a temple honoring his, his adopted father, which is in the middle of the forum, and today you can go there and still see that people lay roses and other things at the spot where he was cremated. Even this past summer, in the middle of July, there were still roses there. People were still laying gifts there. 
and then he decorates the roster of that speaking platform with the heads, the beaks of the ships that he defeated at Actium. Brilliant stuff. So here we go. Here's the trump card. 27 BC, he has consolidated all the power. He's made Rome what he needs to make it, or he's on his way at least. He goes in front of the Senate at the beginning of January, and he says, you know what? I've done everything for the glory of Rome. I've done everything you guys have asked me to do. I give back all my power to you. I become, I, I lay down all my power. I'm becoming a Joe Schmo citizen once more. You guys take control. The Senate goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do without you? Here, take it all back. Now, this was all orchestrated, right? This was not an accident. He orchestrated it. It's his cronies in the Senate, but boy, does it look good, okay? So he reluctantly, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes right now, you just can't see. He reluctantly takes all the power back. But the Senate gives him more stuff. First of all, they give him the title, this name Augustus, which means excellent one, exalted one, glorious one. They also give him more provinces, which means more, more soldiers, right? 20 legions. Um, they give him, so they've got all of these proconsuls leading all of these provinces all over the Roman Empire. But they give him what's called consularis or, or imperium maestas, which means that Okay, these proconsuls have power in their province, but he has imperial power over them, and he, he, he can overpower them at any point. Then they give him a bunch of these, um, a bunch of these like uh, metaphorical uh, kind of notations of his power. So remember, I talked really quickly in Book 8 of the Aeneid, talks about the shield of Aeneas. Well, this is why, because they erect this golden shield in the Curia that celebrates these wonderful Roman values that Octa uh, Augustus uh, says that he espouses, right? Valor, clementia, justitia, pietas, all of that kind of stuff. So this is at the height of his propaganda here. He becomes Augustus Princeps. He says, I'm not a rex, I'm not a dictator, I'm not an imperator. We need to come up with a new title. So he chooses this word that originally meant chieftain, uh, Princeps, but he defines it as primus inter pares, primus inter pares, first among equals. And we, we generally date his rule to the beginning of, of, of this settlement here. We say he ruled from 27 BC all the way to 14 AD. And in a nutshell, he expanded Rome. He built a ton of stuff inside Rome even. And he establishes a dynasty. He doesn't do it easily, but he establishes a dynasty. The guy, the guy could not have a boy to save his life. Uh, he has a couple daughters and um, he... he he adopts one, one heir, and then they die, and then he adopts another heir, and then they die, and it keeps on going. And eventually he has to, he has to settle on his wife's, his stepson, his wife's son by an, an earlier marriage, a guy named Tiberius. But let me tell you, just, just real quickly, this is what he does. This is his legacy, the Pax Augustana, of the Augustan peace. 82 temples in the city of Rome, including that temple of Apollo. He takes, remember the Roman Forum is kind of over here and the Campus Martius is over here in the city of Rome. And he makes the Campus Martius basically his area. Look at these names. Marcellus, adopted son that died. Octavia, his sister. Um, Julia, his, his, the name of his gens, right? The gens Julia. The altar of peace, their Pax Augustana, and then his mausoleum. So right away he builds something and he starts building it early, but he builds something immediately that tells everybody, okay, I... My family is here to stay because a mausoleum doesn't just hold the ashes or the or the, the remains of one person. It holds the remains of a whole line of people. Um, in the form of Monomy builds a bunch of stuff here, two of them. Um, he builds his own form. That's not a new idea. Julius Caesar built a form too, the form of Julius Caesar. But he builds a form of Augustus right next to it, and he dedicates a temple of Mars the Avenger. And that was uh, dedicated, and I think that was dedicated... Um, at the Battle of Actium. So here's what he does. He says, okay, we gotta, we gotta build Rome back up again. I'm, I'm doing it with buildings and water and stuff, but we gotta build up the people and we gotta bring back Rome to its glory. So he makes being married cool again, all right? So he tells the men in, in Rome, look, your job is to marry and have babies. So every time you have babies, I'm gonna give you a bigger tax break. So he makes it economically, financially feasible to, to have a bunch of kids. Then he starts going about winning over the, the hearts and minds of, of, of just the regular people. So he has Virgil write the Aeneid and has it taught to all of the school children. Um, he, he, 
he rededicates these secular games, which this makes its way into the Aeneid too, but um, it has this glorious set of games that, that rededicate, uh, that he rededicates to sort of the future of Rome. Uh, and then finally, um, we talk about the literature. So here we go. He has this, a friend of his named Mycenaeus, who, who we always call the literary patron of Augustus. Um, he's basically like the Tim Gunn, like if you know that guy, like Project Runway, like all that stuff, you know, he's like the, the, the fashionista, spoke, uh, apparently speaking for everybody in America about what is, what is fashionable. That's Mycenaeus. And Mycenaeus' job was to gather a bunch of poets and have them write great poetry and have them infuse their poetry with Augustan propaganda. And, and that's what he does. Um, and, he, and so he, you know, he pays these guys. Here, Horace, here. Don't worry about, about selling stuff. We're just going to pay you a retainer and you just write. So remember those secular games? Horace writes a, a hymn to the secular games, a, a secular hymn, a secular song that glorifies Augustus. Um, and then Propertius and Tibullus and Livy and then we have Virgil. And that's why we're talking about all this stuff. So the idea here is to give you a sense of who Augustus was in his history, but also in, in Roman history, but also who he was in his own history. And then now we're going to go back and, and just take a look at the Aeneid, and, and hopefully this stuff will resonate with you, and we understand why Virgil was paid to write the Aeneid for Augustus and his propaganda.